Good morning, Echo Church. Welcome to service. Make sure you say hi to everyone in the chat room. Let us know who's here. Type out your name. Uh, we are so glad you are back here worshiping with us. We are going to make the best of every situation that we are given. So at this moment, we're going to open in prayer. Before we do, though, I just want you to just clear your mind. Just clear your, clear your head. Just say, I'm going to church right now. I want you to visualize. Visualize getting ready for church, getting in your car, driving up, you know, getting a, a, a donut. Imagine how that donut tasted. <laughs> Imagine that you did not yell at your kids on the way to church this morning, all right? And imagine that you're entering the church building, you're waving at all your friends, all your church family, everyone's so happy to see you. And now let's pray. Father God, Lord, we are so thankful that we have another opportunity to worship you together, even though we are apart. Even though we are in different houses, Lord, we can still come together in spirit to worship you in spirit and in truth. And so, Lord, just thank you for that blessing. And Lord, whatever baggage is, is coming along our people this morning, Lord, I just ask that you just let that just be removed. Let those burdens be lifted this morning as we lift up your name. Lord, help us to lead this battle, whatever we're in, lead it with praise. Help us to open our hearts Open our, open our ears and our eyes to hear and see what you'd have us to hear and see today. Lord, this is your service. This is for you. Help us to praise you. Help us to just continue to lift you up. In Jesus' name, the church says, amen. Stand up where you are. Stand up out of your seat. Worship with our worship team with us.
Well, as you can see, we are filming in a different spot in the church today because I'm wanting to point out our stage that a few of our guys worked on this week. Um, so even though we are keeping our safe social distance, we are going to be working on some projects around the new church building. And so um, I will be reaching out to plenty of you to um, help us with painting or whatever, whatever needs to be done. Um, we're going to use this time wisely. And, but as you can see behind me, we have a, a, they've done a really cool job. Um, maybe I'll show some photos later on. Um, they've done a good job of, of putting the, the top, the, the laminate on the top, and it looks, it looks so great in person. I can't wait for you to see it in person. But that's, that's where we are right now. We are in this weird little limbo with the nation. And what we're going to do as a church is we're going to keep trusting God through it all. We're going to keep doing what we need to do to stay connected. We're going to keep opening the scripture. We're going to keep having church no matter what, because church is not the building. Church is the believers gathering together. I really believe that. Before I begin, though, the message, I do want to say one more thing. I've had a few people um, reach out asking how they could still uh, worship with us with their giving. And of course, the best way to do it is to give online at echovicelia.com. And there's a big give button at the very top. That's the best way. But if you do need to feel like you need to write a check or whatever or, or cash, um, just contact me. Uh, find me online on Facebook or send me a text message if you have my phone number. Um, I'll, I'll help you figure that out. We'll do it safe. Don't worry. We'll be socially distant while we figure out that exchange. Um, but uh, th that's how we'll do giving right now. Um, as you can tell, we're having to do a whole lot of things um, differently than we're used to. But that's fine, and we will be fine. Um, like I said earlier, we are just trusting God through all of this. And he will show us, I, I really believe he'll show us maybe some new aspects of what it means to be a believer, what it means to, to be a church, what it means to trust him and to um, be the body of Christ that he's called us to be. And so that's why we are still gathering on Sundays. We're gathering online. And most importantly, we're spending a lot of time opening the Word and reading the Word. You'll notice this is kind of different than I've been doing sermon series at this church so far. I'm, this is called expositional preaching. It means I'm literally opening the Word and pulling out exactly what the Word is saying rather than picking topics and trying to cram Scripture into the topic. I'm actually opening the Word and pulling the topics out. And um, I really believe this is what we need to be doing for this time. Um, and to be honest, God has been really ministering to me through all this, and I hope he has been ministering to you as well. Um, if this is your first Sunday joining us online, we've been going through the book of 1 Peter. And uh, Peter was an incredible uh, character of the Bible, one of the most interesting in the New Testament for sure. Uh, he, he learned a lot from Jesus. He was one of Jesus' closest friends. And he ends up becoming one of the first pastors of the church. And he writes this letter to Christians, to believers who are scattered, kind of like us, right? And they're needing hope because they're being persecuted. They need hope because they're going through hard trials, kind of like these trials that many of you are going through and, and many of us are going through. And so he's taking his job seriously. His job was, Jesus explicitly told him, Feed my sheep. Love my sheep. And so this book that we're opening up, this letter of 1 Peter, it's, it's Peter feeding and loving Jesus' sheep. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look into this letter and see what is Jesus telling us right here and right now? What timeless truths can we pull out of this book for these hard times that we are in? The biggest idea that I want you to get from this whole series that we're doing is we can open the Bible and hear from God. He can speak to us. You see, as we learned on Wednesday night, this is our nourishment. Or actually, it's probably, I don't remember if it was Wednesday night or last Sunday. But the First Peter chapter 2, it says, this is our nourishment. This is where we are nourished. This is where we can grow as believers. Our soul needs God's word to thrive. And so far in this book, we've learned that Peter's teaching us that, number one, that there is hope, especially in our trials. 
especially in the hard times we're going through, there's always hope. And these hard times we're going through doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. It doesn't mean that God's not with us. It's actually the opposite. He allows these hard times to happen because it's driving us closer to him. And it's allowing us to trust him through the hard times and to have and experience a glory that we would not have experienced otherwise. We've also learned that when we have this hope as believers, that it should drive us to live holy lives. Holy means set, separated, set apart. It means that our lives should look different from other people. People should be able to look at you and say, that person believes something different. That person is following Jesus. You see, the hope that we have in these hard times should drive us to live holy lives. We also learn that we are not here for ourselves. We are a family. Us believers, we're all gathered. We gather together because we're a family. God's putting a family together. We're not here. I'm not here for my own. You know, God didn't save me for my own joy, for my own glory, but he saved me to be part of a big family, to be part of a big group of people who are trusting Jesus together. And we also learned in this, in first Peter that not only is he building a family, each of us are stones in this temple that's going to bring him glory where his presence can reside. He's building a new nation of people. And then on Wednesday night, we talked about how our freedom is found when we submit. Our freedom is found in submission. You see, when we submit our desires, our freedoms, our lives to the authorities that God has established, it causes us to trust God. It frees us to pray for other people. It frees us to not worry so much about ourselves. And it teaches us to care for those that are under our authority. On Wednesday night, I taught that we ought to, uh, from the scriptures, I taught that we ought to submit to our authorities. We need to submit to kings and to governors. And so this week, we're going to continue that thought of submission and talk about how it's not only we need to submit to kings and governors and people who are way above us, but we need to bring this principle, the spiritual principle of submission and authority, even into our own households. This applies not just to nations. This applies to our home. You see, submission is recognizing God's authority in our lives. It's recognizing that I'm not in control of my life anymore. It's recognizing that I ought to do what God is calling me to do. I ought to listen to the people that God have established above me. I ought to trust God with where he has me and live my life in order instead of chaos, in respect instead of rebellion. And do you know what? Jesus did just that. We read in the scripture last week, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, it says, He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor did he threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his cause in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross, so that we can be dead to sin and live for what's right. You see, Jesus himself submitted to authority. He allowed what needed to happen to him happen. And he trusted God through it. And he is our example. He's what we should be modeling our lives after. And so now we're going to open up chapter 3 of 1 Peter. And we're going to take a look about how this submission principle that we find in the scriptures applies directly in our homes. And it's going to sound like I'm picking on one gender over the other for a few minutes. Trust me, that's not what this is about. This is not about chauvinism or one thing is better than the other. What we're going to see by the end of this um, message today is that God has orchestrated the household in a specific way to bring him glory and to bring us joy. And so come with me as we read um, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. He begins with, In the same way, you wives— Oh, let's stop there real quick— <laughs> Before we continue on, in the same way, you see, Peter was talking about Jesus and how Jesus suffered and how Jesus submitted his life to to, to the authority that God has established over him. You see, if Jesus lived in submission, what Peter is doing with this first verse in chapter 3 is he's continuing the thought. He said, this is Jesus. Jesus is our example. Jesus is the one we're following, we're modeling our lives after. In the same way, 
So everything that he's going to say from here on out, he's saying Jesus was able to do it. Jesus modeled this for us. Now, in the same way, you should do that. So here's what he says. In the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. You see, what he's saying here in this very first part of the scripture is he's saying that submission is an obligation. You must accept the authority of your husbands. God has established a certain order, especially in the home. You see, and it's, 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 it's about order and authority. It's not about value. He's not saying you should accept the authority of that man who's better than you. He's not saying you should accept the authority of that man who is worth more than you. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying you should accept the authority of that person who has that role in your life. So wives, you should accept the authority of your husbands. Husbands and wives are partners. They're not competitors. And so this whole thing about there, it's a power struggle between men and women, it feels that way, but it should not feel that way. You see, we shouldn't be competitors in our households. We should be partners, complementing each other, working together, being the people that God has called us to be. And the reason we do it is because we are, are trying to use our marriages, trying to use our, our family, our households, to show the world what Jesus did. Jesus submitted his life. I can submit my life. That's what it should be about. He says, you must accept the authority of your husbands. Then, even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. See, even Peter understood that there'll be women whose husbands probably aren't believers. And so what Peter is saying here is he's saying, even if your husbands aren't listening to the gospel, even if your husbands aren't believers, he's saying, your godly lives will preach to them. You see, submission not only is an obligation, submission is an opportunity. What Peter's saying, he says, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. What he's saying is you don't need to nag your husband. You don't need to demean him. You don't need, you don't need to make him feel worthless or useless or wrong. Christian woman, you don't need to be the preacher with your words with your attitude. What you need to be is the godly example. The wife who accepts authority in her life. Your submission is an opportunity to show that you believe something different. And he, he continues, well, before I go there, I just want to reiterate that. Your character and your conduct will preach. Your character and your conduct will preach. And I'm going to submit to you, this not only applies to your husband, your character and your conduct will also preach to your whole family. The way you treat your husband, your children will pick up on that. If you do not respect your husband, why do you expect your children to? I don't care if he's wrong. It's not about wrong or right. It's about respect. And it's about how you conduct yourself. You see, your spirit is contagious. And so, Christian woman, you need to make sure that the Holy Spirit is what your spirit is in tune with. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Are these the things that you are experiencing in your household? Or is your household experiencing strife? Is your household experiencing worry or anxiety? Is there anger? You see, you need to allow your spirit, you need to allow your, your conduct to preach the good news of the gospel. And the good news is submission. It involves submission. It involves honoring your husband, respecting your husband. He finishes his thought with saying, 
So he says, your godly lives will speak to them without any words, and they will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. In your house, is purity and reverence even valued? Is it even a value? You see, there's a lot of believers that they want to go out and change the world. They want, they want the, to take this gospel and, and just see the world around them change. I'm here to tell you, if the gospel didn't change your household, then you're not going to have much of an effect on the rest of the world. Your house is the first place the gospel needs to be displayed. Because no matter what you do outside your house, if it's not being displayed in your house, that everything else that you, are, that you build up is going to fall down. When people come into your home, they need to see the love. They need to see the joy. Yes, I'm not saying that your life is going to be perfect. It's, it, it, come look at my house sometimes. It's, it's a crazy wreck half the time. Not half the time, but it's a crazy wreck. It, that's, that's just life. But under, underneath it all, underneath the fights and the arguments, underneath there's this respect and there's this joy And there's this honor. And we're not perfect. But what I'm telling you is that you need to remember that you need to to really think about the environment that you are creating in your home. Because your submission is an opportunity for the gospel. Verse 3, he continues on. He says, And don't be concerned about outward beauty or fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourself instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. This is how the women of old made themselves beautiful. They put their trust in God and accepted the authority of their husbands. You see, submission not only is an obligation, not only is submission an opportunity for the gospel, submission is an ornament. This word says that, or or I should say, the world says that you should put on a show. The world says that you need to look sexy. The world says that you need to look like you have it all together. The world says that you need to, to, to put on the right things and dress the right way and be the right person in order to have your value. But this scripture is telling us that you can't put on or take off true beauty. You can't put on and take off true beauty. The true beauty comes from a spirit that is submissive. A spirit that doesn't put self above others. A spirit that is honoring. A spirit that is open to seeing how, the, how, how God can work through your life. That's what makes you beautiful. And when you have that, that spirit, you don't need all, the, all the, the stuff to hide anymore because your true self will just shine through. It'll just shine through. What I, what I do want to kind of put this out there because there's been so many Christians in the past who have taken these verses and saying, well, God's anti-makeup or God's anti-jewelry. That's not what these verses are talking about at all. Sometimes you got to paint the barn. Let's just be honest. I hope I got a laugh out of that. That's that's the problem with me preaching without anyone in the seats. I don't know if I'm getting laughs or not. So, but what I'm saying here is, Peter's not anti-makeup, anti-jewelry, anti-wearing good clothes. What he's saying is that they can't make up for inner beauty. Right? If you enjoy wearing makeup, wear makeup to the glory of God. If you enjoy wearing nice clothes, wear nice clothes to the glory of God. Don't let it distract you. Don't let it become a distraction. You should be modest. There's other verses in the Bible that talks about that. But what you shouldn't do is try to put on all these things in order to make up for a hole that's in your heart. What you shouldn't do is try to put on all these things to hide the ugliness that you cannot control or you're not willing to control. That's what these scriptures are saying. Let's keep reading. He says, For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband, Abraham, and called him master. You are her daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. You see, the main point that he's getting through these verses 
is when we submit ourselves to God's order, we are then free to trust God. You see, it's not about the husband. He, he probably doesn't deserve a lot of honor. He probably doesn't always deserve a lot of accolades. He probably doesn't deserve a whole lot. But it's not about your husband. You see, submission is not about the king that you're serving. Submission is not about the governor that you're under. Submission is, is about you and God. It's about you living in the role that God has placed you in where you are. And so when you say, I'm going to submit, even though, it's, even though it doesn't feel always right, even though I'm not getting my way, when you submit faithfully, what it is, is it's you giving God that part of your life. It's you saying, God, I'm going to trust you with this part of my life, even though I don't completely understand it. That's what submission does. And so women, I just spent the last, how, how, you know, the last three verses focused on you. But I, I really believe this is, this is part of creating, of a, not creating, of applying the spiritual principle to your household. And I, I believe Peter probably spent the first part talking to the women because, to be honest, the women of the time and the Roman times, they didn't have as much clout or education as the men did. And so he probably focused on them because they probably didn't have a lot of education. The very fact that Peter was even writing to women probably blew a lot of people's minds. The very fact that Peter spent time in this letter talking explicitly to women shows that God values women. He does. He loves you. He wants to reach out to you. You're part of the plan. Yes, he's telling you to submit to your husband, not because you're worth less than your husband, but because that is the place in the order of that God is ordering things. You see, our God is a God of order, not chaos. And so we have to respect that. And so when you see these verses in the Bible, women, that are pointed towards you, instead of taking the modern feminist worldview of, oh, it's just anti-woman and it's about the man getting us down, that's not what it's about at all. It's about God valuing you, God cherishing you. He wants you to have the very best. But he knows that it's probably you that are in your own way a lot of the time. And so what he's trying to teach you is to live a life of submission so that you can trust him more. Now let's jump over to the men. Verse, verse 7. What we're going to find out, men, is yes, the wives have an obligation to submit to the authority of their husband, but men, it is our duty to not take this authority lightly. You see, when God gives you a responsibility He's going to judge you according to what he has given you. Men, we have such a responsibility for the women in our lives. This is not something we can joke about. This is not something that we can play around with. Men in our culture, you know, it, it, a lot of people treat the men in our culture like Homer Simpsons. A bunch of lazy, self-involved, self-important. Um, just lazy, lazy, lazy. Men, that is not our, that's not what God has called us to be. Men not only should be caring for the wives, they should go out of, their, out of their way to cherish the women in their lives. Not just their wives, but other women that are around them, to cherish them, to protect them, to love them, to enjoy them, to honor them. And so Peter's going to, going to spend some time talking to the men here too, and we're going to pull out parts we're going to pull out what God is saying to the men. And what God's saying, I'm going to kind of jump the gun here, spoiler alert. You're responsible. You got to own up to that. This is on you. If God is giving you authority, then you have to, you have to respect that and not take it lightly. Verse 7, in the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, 
but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should so that your prayers will not be hindered. This is such an important verse. To be honest, if there's any verse that, that a husband needs, I think this is, this is probably a great one to pin as a, as a value in your household. Men, this is my responsibility. This is what God has called me to do. I have authority in my house, but this is my responsibility that comes along with that authority. And so what, what Peter's saying here is there's four areas of responsibility that men, that we are, that we have to take to heart, that we cannot take for granted. So we're going to look at this scripture here together. The first one I want to point out is there is a physical responsibility. You see, he says, treat your wife with understanding as you live together. Other versions of the Bible say as you dwell together. And what that comes with, there's this physical responsibility. You need to be with your wife. Yes, sexually, but more than sexually. You need to be with her. You need to hang out with your wife. Spend time with your wife. I know some people might be laughing, like, that's a funny idea, but there's many marriages where the husband and wife are separated for long periods of time. You're separated all day at work, and then you go off to hang out with your own friends at night. And all that's going to do is it's going to train you to be separate. You need to make efforts. And I understand there's seasons in your life where life gets busy for whatever reason, if that's the case, then you have to make sure that you come back together. That you live together. That you are present. When you're together, you're not on your phones. And Cheryl knows that I'm preaching to myself on this one. Because she'll say, I want to spend time with you. I'm like, we're right, we're right here, all day together. We're next to each other. And she's like, you're on your phone. I'm like, oh yeah. When you're with your wife, put the phone down. Put the TV away. It's time to spend life together, to live together. We need to be, we have this area of physical responsibility with our wives. And you have to provide. I think part of this physical responsibility is you have to be a provider. I don't know what your financial situation is in your home, but men, this is on us. We need to be the providers of our families. This is our responsibility. And if I need to have a pastoral conversation with you at some other point, we can totally do that. But this is on us to be the providers of our homes, to make sure that our wives and our children are taken care of. It's on you. This is your responsibility. The second area of responsibility we're going to point out today is intellectual. He says, treat your wife with understanding. With understanding. What does that mean? It means listen to her. Listen to her. It becomes our goal, or it should become our goal, men, to really get to understand our wives. To really try. To really take the time to try to understand what this complicated mess God has given us is. <laughs> you see, we as men... Husbands, we should know our wives better than their best friends. And in many cases, that doesn't happen. And if there's some kind of walls between you and your wife, then men, it's your job to break down those walls. Don't wait for her to do it. Don't wait for her to make that step, make that effort. Men, this is on you. This is your responsibility. You have the authority of the household, then take the authority. Break down the walls that need to break down and spend time with your wife and listen to her. Make understanding her your goal. What a shame would it be for you to be married 20-something years and to not know what makes her tick, not know what makes her happy, to not know what her joys were. What a shame. This is on you. Understand your wife. Another area of responsibility, men, that we have is an emotional one. It's emotional. He says right here, in the same way, you must give honor to your wives. 
Give honor to her. That means treasure her. Make her feel loved. Be a gentleman. Respect her. Here's the deal. If I'm talking to you about your family, hey, how are things going? Don't make a joke about your wife. Don't joke about her. Even if, even if it's your guy friends, don't make jokes about her. You respect your wife. God has given you a wife. The, the scripture says, he who finds a wife has found a good thing. It means it's something that many people take for granted, that they don't completely understand. God has not given you a person to denigrate or to disrespect. I tell you what, if I see a man speaking ill about his wife in public, I think bad about him. It's disgusting. If you, as the man of that house, do not respect your wife, then who will? This is your responsibility. As the man, this is your job and it's your authority to set the emotional temperature of your household. Yes, she should submit to your authority, but you better provide a place where that submission can feel okay. You cannot create an environment that is so chaotic and so horrible that submission to her is suffering. Any man who makes his wife suffer is not a man. And God will not take that lightly. It's your job to create the home that honors God and preaches the gospel. Man, it's your job to set the emotional temperature of the home. You cannot be absent emotionally. If there's chaos, then it's on you. It's on you. You have to create the environment that honors God. You have to create that environment that we talked about earlier where your, where your wife and your children could live pure and reverent lives. If your life isn't pure, if your life isn't reverent, how do you expect your household to be? This is on you. Spiritual. The last area of responsibility, men, that Peter is talking about here is the spiritual responsibility. He says, treat her as you should so that your prayers will not be hindered. You see, every part of your household, every decision that you make for your family, it should include God. It should include God. You have to make an effort to put him first in your life and in your house. That means for you, men, you need to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You need to say, our priority is going to be going to church on Sunday, whether it's in a building or whether it's online. You see, a lot of, a lot of households are driven by the women on the spiritual thing. The men, they just kind of leave that to the wives to kind of cart the whole family around to go to church and stuff. Men, this is on you. That's not your, your wife's job is not to make those spiritual, you, it's your authority. It's your responsibility. Men, this needs to be driven from you. You need to say, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. You need to say, we are going to have a family prayer time. We are going to pray before we eat our meal. We're going to honor God in every part of our family life. This is on you. You set not only the emotional temperature of the household, but the spiritual temperature. This is on you. You have to make an effort to put him first. And as you both draw closer to him, what ends up happening is you draw closer to each other. What you end up doing is you end up making this family that no one can separate. You end up building this this huge display of the gospel that no one can denigrate. It's on you. So take charge. Take the authority. Take the responsibility that is given you. You see, this is all going back to the very main point of this whole message about submission and authority. 
single people. You might be saying, oh, this, this message isn't for me this week. This message is definitely for you. All of our lives, every part of our lives needs to be living in submission and under authority. And the main point of this message is if you have the privilege of having authority, then you need to treat it with honor and respect. You need to treat it seriously. If you have people looking up to you, if you have people submitting themselves to your authority, then there is more responsibility on your shoulders and God is not going to take that lightly. And this spiritual principle of submission and authority, it has to begin in the home. In the home. And I'm here to tell you, if you find yourself, you're saying, Tim, I'm not living up to these things. I'm not living up to these standards that Peter's talking about. Then now is the time to make the change. Right here, right now, we are in quarantine. You are now with your family more than you would be otherwise. Now is the time. You have the time now to begin reading your Bible together, to begin praying together. Why are you waiting till Sunday morning to worship together? Why are you waiting till, till Wednesday evening to open the Bible? Now is the time to begin doing the things that you need to do so that God can use your family to preach the gospel, not only to each other, but to everyone who's watching. And I'm here to tell you, there are so many people who are watching. Your children, they're watching you. Your children's friends, believe it or not, your children's friends are watching you. They're learning about what they want their homes to be like. You have so much capability for impact in this world just, just by leading your homes right. I know this has been a message of conviction for a lot of people. I'm convicted. I'm the one preaching it, and there's like three things now. I'm like, oh, Cheryl's going to have a list for me when I get back. Just kidding, but not. <laughs> I'm here to tell you the conviction is, is here, but this is what we need. We need to work on these things. This church needs to be a place where families have such respect for each other. Where men enjoy and love their wives and where wives enjoy and respect and honor their husbands. Imagine if we were a church where every family had that gospel submission and authority going on in their homes. How much more effective would we be as a group? So you, you can start now. You can ask your spouse for forgiveness. Tell, tell your children, I'm sorry, I've not been the example I've needed to be. Seek their forgiveness. Ask God for forgiveness. Ask him to start showing you how. If you need to talk to someone before you go and get outside help, talk to your spouse. Let's, let's make a date coming up soon. Tell your husband or your wife, let's make a date where we can talk about how we can plan our future as a family. It's that important. You ought to do it. Let us pray. Father God, Lord, I'm so thankful once again to have the privilege and opportunity to, to read your word and to preach Lord, I'm trusting you that, that your word will not return void. Lord, I'm trusting you that you know the hearts and the lives of your people. And I know that your spirit is working on many hearts right now as they listen to what you are telling them. Help us all, Lord, to take this to heart. Help our, our wives, Lord, to honor their husbands. Lord, to submit gracefully. Lord, to, to, um, to be okay with their role, but also, Lord, to find beauty in it, to find joy in it. 
most of all, to trust you through it. And Lord, help the men in this church be men who are worthy of honor, worthy of respect, to not take their authority lightly. Lord, help each of us learn what we need to do to make our households a display of the gospel. Let there be so much grace here. Let there be so much hope here. Lord, I know there's a lot of anxiety coming up with, with the, the disease that's going around. Lord, there's a lot of economic turmoil. And all statistics say that these kinds of things should tear families apart. But Lord, let that not be the case with this church. Let every family of this church be strengthened through all of this turmoil. Lord, let us come out of this trial with glory. Let us come out with a testimony that we trusted you and we sought you through it. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We know you're doing great things. Continue to, to just show us your glory. And let us just keep honoring you with our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, the church all over says, Amen. I'll see you Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. We're going to keep going through First Peter. And I do want to say, today's Palm Sunday. Um, so I'll be sending out some social media posts later on today about that. But let's not forget that this week we are celebrating the resurrection. We are celebrating Jesus all week. I'll see you Wednesday night.